This is the Free Hill Life Podcast number eight. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, and I'm coming to you from the Free Hill Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And it's good to be back this week, you guys. And got some powder skiing in yesterday. That was super nice. It's been snowing quite a bit here in Utah. And I know uh, a bunch of other places. So hopefully you guys are all out getting some and and, uh, getting those turns in. Seems like the winter's always going faster than... uh, you think it's going to go and before you know it it's spring and uh we got to hop into summer so good to get out and get some turns so i hope you guys are out there doing some skiing so uh to start things off today uh just a couple newsroom items uh we didn't put a whole lot up on telemarkskier.com this week uh, but there is an updated review of the m equipments major 2.1 craig dossi kind of went back through and kind of caught everything up with that and uh, it's a super good review if you're interested in the tech toe stuff and kind of want to get a feel for Majo specifically um, he does a great job of kind of breaking down the technical aspects of the binding the tech toe stuff uh, and you know icing issues things like that so definitely would encourage you to to read up on that and uh We've been working on some, uh, we finally kind of got the uh, second version or this year's version of the 22 Designs links in. So we're starting to put together some reviews of that and uh, definitely we'll get those up. I know we're, we'll probably try to do kind of a Majo versus Links uh, review at some point <clears throat> and uh, get that going. So that's kind of it for Tech Toe. Coming up this week, you should be seeing an updated review on the Scott Synergy, which is uh, the Scott's uh, previously Garmont 75 millimeter four buckle boot. Um, and the, actually the Scott Synergy now is is the old Garmont Energy. But uh, we're kind of back cataloging some of that. Uh, those boots and bindings are still prevalent and uh, we want to kind of make sure that that stuff's up on the, on the site as well so you can find some information about it. Uh, there also was a Telemark free ride championships uh, with a junior division announced in Taos, New Mexico with a uh, college uh, slash 18 plus um, competition that was announced. So there's an article going up on that with some more info. And also just a reminder, sixth annual World Telemark Day is coming up in March, first Saturday in March. So make sure to read up on that, how you can participate all on your own at your local hill, backcountry zone, living room, but preferably uh, on snow. So uh, I think that was a couple episodes ago, I talked about World Telemark Day and what that's all about. So definitely go back and check that episode out if you're interested in finding out more about our international holiday celebrating the best turn on the snow. So today... Uh, today's episode is kind of brought to you by a lot of questions coming into the email, which I appreciate you guys all sending in and letting me know what kind of information you guys are looking for. I think these, uh, first episodes are, are a really great opportunity for me and my guests to kind of chime in on some of these questions, but really the basics of of stuff that we talk to with people every day uh, here at the Free Hill Life Telemark shop. Uh, emails we get, Facebook messages, Instagram DMs, all that good stuff. And one of the most common questions I think we hear is what makes a great Telemark ski? So today I'm going to try and tackle some of the basics of that. Obviously, just like any of these other topics, we could go incredibly deep and detailed and um, I'm going to try and sort of get the basics out of the way to help us kind of get a feel for um, you know just the basics of the topic you know a starting point if you will about skis and share a couple of my thoughts on what makes a great telemark ski and what we see people uh, taken out of our shop and, and having good experiences on and whatnot. Uh, like always, because I'm a big telemark history nerd, I always like to start off with a little history. And the reason I like to do that, 
to give us a little context. And I feel like that's one of the things I often see with Telemark in general is that there is an in- incredibly rich history, like I've said, uh, over and over again. Sometimes, uh, as, as in most cases with history, some things become forgotten. And uh, that, uh, that context can really help us kind of understand where, where Telemark skis are at today or skis in general are at today, I guess, uh, would be a better way to say it. So just to kind of give you guys a brief history of quote-unquote Telemark skis, um, I think uh, kind of to go back to the beginning, and again, I'm not going to go super, super deep on this. Uh, I mainly just want to kind of have a, a medium-sized podcast. I never quite know how long they're going to be, but I don't want to get too crazy. I want to kind of just touch on what your your modern day needs would be but if we go back to kind of like when telemark skiing sort of um, had a resurgence in the late 70s early 80s in the united states um, back then uh, most of what people considered a telemark ski was a nordic ski with metal edges so you had a double cambered ski in most cases, which means the literally the camber underfoot, kind of that arc. If you don't know what camber is, it's the arc under the foot. And uh, with Nordic skis, uh, you tend to have a double camber, which obviously the arc is taller. And that was so you could actually put a stickier wax called a kick wax into that pocket. So for Telemark skis back then, people were primarily using these, uh, you know, 200 to 210 centimeter uh, double cambered skis with metal edges and some of the skis that you might have seen back then were uh, the Europa 99s, Carhu uh, Extremes, the Rosignol uh, Rondonet and uh, the list goes on. Uh, there was quite a few skis in that era um, that had metal edges and you know obviously you needed the edges in order to edge on harder snow. Um, and that obviously became important, especially as Telemark skiers weren't only in the backcountry, but they might be taking that equipment into a resort. It's pretty hard to turn when you don't have metal edges. Uh, it, it is doable, uh, but pretty tricky. So uh, as we kind of moved into the early 90s, you're going to see that there were actually Telemark specific skis. And this was a, a pretty cool time is... I would uh, hopefully in the future be able to talk to some of the people that were involved with these companies. I would love that. So if for some reason you're listening to the podcast and you worked for some of these companies in the early nineties, uh, let's connect. I would love to have you on the podcast and kind of talk about some of this stuff. Um, you know, I, I started telemarketing in 93. So I was around when some of these companies were around and, and selling telemark skis, but uh, I would love to actually kind of get some behind the scenes on that. Um, early nineties, you had companies like Tua and that was kind of an offshoot, uh, offshoot of, uh, Chouinard equipment, Yvonne Chouinard, who later went on to, um, make Patagonia after he started Black Diamond, or I guess that kind of came out of Chouinard equipment, Black Diamond and Patagonia, <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, you had companies like Kazama, Black Diamond was making skis back then. And you basically had these Telemark specific skis. So a lot of those went back to a more traditional camber. Um, The length tended to stay the same. They started getting a little wider with some of those. Um, Black Diamond especially. Um, uh, I I remember uh, one of my first Black Diamond skis was the Black Diamond Tele Sava, which was actually kind of an offshoot of uh, one of the Tua I think there was actually a Tua Telly Sava. But what you were seeing is, uh, you know, you were having more aggressive boots, like a, a plastic cuff boot, like the Merrill Super Comp, and still a leather bottom. And then by 1992, you had plastic boots, right? So some of these skis were uh, tr- really, the boots binding skis were all kind of coming together in terms of what they looked and felt like. And they were specific to Telemark in the sense that uh, they were probably geared towards uh, backcountry hiking, 
but they also could handle, you know, these beefier boots and stronger bindings. So in that sense, when you're talking about Telemark specific skis, this was definitely an era that early nineties, mid nineties era, I think where, uh, at least based on my recollection, um, you know, we kind of went away from just using these kind of super Nordic influenced skis or Nordic skis with metal edges and kind of started having these more specific telemark skis. Um, cause you kind of got into the mid nineties and this is, this is, like I said, when I got into telemark, uh, it, it was kind of at a cool time now that I look back because, um, it kind of reminds me of right now. And in, in some senses, because one, you had, uh, you had the leather boot crowd and imagine anybody who telemarked up to that point, you utilized a leather boot in some way, shape or form, whether it was a low cuff boot or a leather boot with a plastic upper cuff, uh, or even like a supportive cuff that could be added to the leather. And then you had plastic boots. And so there was this great divide, you know, people saying that plastic boots, uh, weren't telemark so if that sounds familiar to you in uh 2020 with the whole ntn and 75 millimeter thing uh it's uh just kind of history repeating itself uh with with the boots back then and the bindings now so it's kind of funny when you think about it but one of the other things and in, in more specifically with the skis is i remember uh in the mid in the mid 90s a few years after i'd gotten into telemark skiing I started seeing uh, older tele skiers were u- starting to ski on uh, Alpine skis and put Telemark bindings on them, um, especially like some of the K2 skis, um, uh, like the K2 Extreme and, and stuff like that. And then I'd see guys put like a, re- a Black Diamond Riva 2 or, or Riva 1 binding on those or even a Super Loop. And, uh, you know... It, telemark specific skis kind of weren't as necessary all of a sudden and people are you know ripping down on alpine skis and there was definitely you know i i remember i don't remember a ton in that era but i remember people saying things like you know you can't use alpine skis but yet all, all these ripping you know telly guys and and girls were starting to mount alpine skis as well and you know you could obviously find used use skis all over the place even back then so um that's when i first started kind of remembering people starting to use alpine skis at least in in the in the time that i started telemark skiing and so you always had that you know that's kind of mid 90s and then late 90s going into the early 2000s you're starting to see the emergence of even more uh telemark brands or maybe people kind of coming uh companies coming back around and making telemark skis some of the most notable ones for those that telemark back then was obviously k2 telemark which had an incredible impact on um the image of telemark back then um you know in the in the mid 90s all of a sudden you start seeing these stickers of uh rondonne french for can't telly uh, if it were easy, it would be called snowboarding and K2 telemark, you know, that was, that, th- these were these slogans, uh, that kind of went along on these stickers and kind of poking fun at, you know, uh, Rondine, for those of you that don't know, is probably more commonly known as Alpine touring or AT skiing now. And this is all the way back in the nineties. So, um, and then also, uh, um, the graphics these guys were putting out, I think that one of the first, uh, um, the, one of the first K2 skis I remember seeing K2 telemark skis I remember seeing was, you know, flames on the front and just kind of a radical graphic. And this was all due to, uh, Mike Hatrip, uh, who some of you may know from watching in the nineties, um, Greg Stump movies and Warren Miller movies, uh, I believe Blizzard of Oz and and some of those with Glenn Plake. I mean, he was right there with those guys, Plake, Schmidt, and uh, whatnot. And he really helped develop K2 Telemark. And anybody who Telemarked in the late 90s into the early 2000s, I mean, there was all these great skis, the World Peace, uh, World Peace, uh, P2 
pieced off all these different fun names that kind of win it. And it just kind of gave an awesome edge. Um, you know, these, these were telemark, uh, skis and they were separate from their Alpine counterpart NK2, uh, Rosignol, same thing. Uh, Rosignol was making the black widow skis, which is, uh, a really well-known one from the nineties. And then they kept making skis kind of into the early two thousands. Carhu, uh, definitely needs to be mentioned in that in the early two thousands. And Carhu definitely was making, uh, telemark, uh, telemark branded skis, if you will. And, uh, this is probably kind of a good segue. I wanted to just kind of give you that history all the way from kind of that Nordic era. And you've got this double camber metal edge ski, you kind of got into an era, early late eighties, early nineties, where you started getting Telemark specific skis, and then by the late nineties, early two thousands, you're kind of back to where Telemark specific skis were in many cases, uh, skis that were being manufactured by companies uh, like Rosignol or Carhu, and maybe they were tweaking it. Uh, to be a quote unquote telemark ski. I remember, especially in the early 2000s, there was kind of this mentality that uh, you'd always hear people say, like, well, what's the difference with a telemark ski versus an alpine ski? And it was always the same answer. It's like, oh, well, telemark skis are softer, uh, meaning they probably don't have as much material in there, metal especially, uh, so that the flex of the ski uh, is, is a little bit softer. And that was kind of one of these characteristics that people pushed. And so in, in the early 2000s, you had kind of an interesting time where several of the companies that were making quote unquote telemark skis were pretty much uh, making skis with a different top sheet, uh, meaning the top graphic was different, but there was an Alpine counterpart uh, that existed that was probably pretty much the same ski. In some cases, it was stiffer. And quite honestly, there was a, definitely quite a few cases where uh, it was just the same ski with a different graphic. And um, I, to give you kind of an example of that, um, I was working with Carhu back in that era in kind of 2003, four, And uh, Carhu really was one of the pioneers in bringing really fat skis to the mix for Telemark. And that was with the Carhu Jack. Uh, if I remember right, it was, I think, 90 millimeters underfoot. So <laughs> kind of give you a, a dated version of a fat ski. Um, but that was pretty important, you know, in that time to have that width of a ski underfoot. Um, for those that were paying attention, um, it, yeah, it seemed like Carhu, man, those guys are really pushing the envelope and really trying to, you know, do something different. I think what a lot of people may or may not have understood at that point in time was, uh, Carhu, uh, the company that owned Carhu, Track Sports USA, uh, also owned Line Skis. And so the Carhu Jack had an Alpine component called the line mothership and basically the same skis, you know, um, the, the construction, uh, I, 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 and don't quote me on this. <laughs> I'm not totally sure if the construction was identical, but it was pretty close. Um, and, and that trend kind of continued, uh, the, there was a twin tip ski called the car who agent and it had a, it was one of the line, um, models with a different top sheet uh, the later on the Carhu team 100, the team 130, these were the profit 100 line skis and the profit 130, um, Rosignol, same exact thing. Um, you know, there was similar skis that just had a different top sheet. So as far as just kind of get giving you guys a history, I think the context of the idea of a telemark specific ski is in truth, there has existed Telemark specific skis, but in a lot of cases, uh, you know, in the last 30 years, there's been a lot of, a lot of times where it's maybe a graphic difference 
and maybe there's not something specific to telemark skiing, uh, whatever that may be. So that kind of brings us up to date. And hopefully, I think the important part of giving you guys those examples is to really help you understand the the concept of a telemark specific ski that phrase in and of itself i think now that you have a little history hopefully this will give you kind of some context as we talk about what makes a great quote unquote telemark ski in two in 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 2020 um first question are there telemark specific skis now i would argue that the answer is no. And what I mean by that is, um, is anybody making the construction of skis incredibly specific to telemark? Um, or, or better yet, let me reframe this to say, if you, if someone said they have a telemark specific ski, could you not use that and put alpine bindings on it and have a good alpine ski kind of reversing it from the situation we're in, right? Like where we may go buy an alpine ski mounted with telemark bindings and you know, it, we use it for telemark and somebody else could use it for alpine. Um, it, the, the construction's not made so you can't do alpine or telly on it, but Here's what I here's what I am going to say. What does make a telemark specific ski? And sometimes I actually like to use the phrase telemark centric because some core construction is better for telemark. And we'll talk a little more about these characteristics. Some core construction is better. Uh some uh shapes are better in my opinion. Um and also, what makes a great telemark ski is where your money goes. And this is kind of a big one. And I want to, I'm not going to go too crazy off the deep end talking about this topic, but you guys will hear me talk about this in the future. Um, what helps grow telemark is by spending your hard earned dollars with people that are making equipment that is specifically for telemark skiers. And um, in the ski realm, it's incredibly important that if you find a ski and there's, there's not a lot of options for telemark centric skis, but if you, some of these boutique manufacturers and small ski makers that are making skis and they are geared towards a telemark skier specifically, and they may even call it a telemark ski supporting that as a telemark skier is one in my opinion one of the most important things we can do moving forward because it these are items that are these are skis specifically that are made with the telemark skier in mind but more importantly your dollars actually revolve back into trying to make other products or skis or maybe other things that are geared at telemark skiers and if we want to grow Telemark, it's important to have these types of companies and that we rely on. They're going to be smaller. They're not going to be massive companies. And, they're, you know, it's probably going to be one guy in his garage making stuff or, or, or smaller companies. But you know that your dollars actually go to Telemark. So that's one of the first things is what makes a Telemark ski where your money goes. Um, it's, it's kind of a simple one but I think one that is often overlooked. Um, when we're talking about what makes a good telemark skis in terms of features, the first thing I think that's important in terms of features is you need to sit yourself down and figure out what kind of skier you are and what kind of telemark skier you are. Or maybe you're just getting in, into telemark skiing and you're an alpine skier or you're a snowboarder. Um, there's a couple of things that you can identify about you and yourself and your style and your objectives that are really going to help you identify the features of the ski. Um, most importantly is probably geography. Um, do you live in the East coast of the United States? Do you live in the West coast? Um, 
Do you have icy conditions? Do you have more packed powder conditions and deeper snow? Uh, are you trying to buy one ski that fits all things? You know, in other words, a one quiver ski, or do you have the ability to have multiple skis? So obviously these are, you know, in your ability level, you know, uh, and then just personal preference, uh, your weight, your height, these things are super important. So, um, but to kind of generalize, and it's something we use here in the shop all the time, and, and I'll give you kind of a generalization of what types of skis in terms of, of kind of the profile that I think works really well these days. And it's this, uh, a little early tip rise, meaning uh, the, if you're not familiar with the phrase tip rise, it basically means that uh, kind of on a, on a more modern ski, you're going to have the contact point on the snow when the skis flex. It actually has a little, it's, it's created a, the shape of the ski actually kind of as it connotates, it has this early tip rise. It's got a little bit of tip that kind of comes off the snow when it's pressed down. And um, why that's important, especially I think in Telemark, and I, it wasn't really created with a Telemark skier in mind. I mean, this is obviously something that kind of came out with, um, in the Alpine industry, but I think it works fantastic with Telemark. And I'm surprised that someone that wasn't making a more Telemark centric product in the past thought of this. And here's the reason why, uh, anybody who's tellied or learned how to telly in soft snow, especially or crud, uh, chopped up snow, there's oftentimes what we call the telly roll. Uh, it's basically like your mid turn and your inside leg gets hooked up and your tip dives, and the next thing you know, you're you're somersaulting down the hill. Not always super fun. Um, what early tip rise does, uh, and nothing super dramatic, but just a little bit, I think it makes an incredible difference in, in the situation where you're skiing soft snow, powder, uh, crud, chopped up stuff. And uh, in those scenarios, the early tip rise is on your inside leg. So the, the knee, the side that you're dropping your knee on, I think it really helps plane the tip upward as you're pressuring the ball of your foot on your ski. And that makes, uh, it makes it much easier to, uh, not try to compensate by back seating your turn. And it allows you to kind of move forward in an aggressive stance, um, and keep the pressure, on the front of your boots and not on the back of your boots to try to create flotation. So that's the first thing, early tip rise. I think that's a fantastic thing to look for. And even on a, you know, uh, an all mountain ski that you may use, uh, on the East coast, even a little early tip rise there is, is fantastic because it, when it is soft, even if it's a couple inches, you're going to benefit from it. And I think even, even in that little chopped up stuff, uh, it helps a lot. So early tip rise would be the first feature that in most cases um, is a good feature to look for uh, in that. I, tra I, I usually push, feature number two, I usually push traditional camber, meaning that it's, it's not reverse camber uh, where it's kind of an arc underneath your foot. It's actually more of a traditional ski where if you just set the ski on the ground, there's kind of a an arc, uh, under the foot. And I'm trying to describe it in layman's terms in case someone out there, you don't know what camber is. Uh, but if you put a ski down on the ground, you'll, you'll see it. there's kind of a little arc to it. If you push it down, you're, you're actually flexing the camber of the ski. So I think that's feature number two, traditional camber. The reason I say that is I just think it works better overall. Um, you know, there's flat camber skis where there's zero camber. Um, there's reverse camber, which is almost like if you think like more of a, from tip to tail, it's more of a, a concave, uh, type of situation. And there's obviously, um, you know, a time and place for these types of things, but for the average skier, keep it simple, you know, early tip rise with some traditional camber. And then as far as the tail goes, I mean, you could have all sorts of tail dimensions and some are flat tails, some are turned up a little bit. <clears throat> They're all 
there's just different ones. Um, I, I'm not super worried about the tail as much. Um, I think more what you need to figure out is with your ability level, this is kind of where that stiffness comes in that we were sort of talking about, you know, back in the day when people were like, oh, well, Telemark skiers, you need a softer ski. Well, I think, uh, I think the hardest part about generalizing this is not everybody needs a softer ski. If you're starting out, if you're, if you're a beginner Telemark skier, um, maybe you're not super aggressive. Um, most people in general, a softer ski, uh, is going to be better. So the flex of the ski, if you were to push on the ski, you know, you're going to be able to feel these stiffnesses and, um, a softer ski that way is, is going to be a little bit easier to initiate your turns and, and so on. There's also the torsional rigidity of a ski that kind of plays into this. And that's actually where if you were to take kind of gripping the edges of the ski and try to twist the ski side to side, it's a little bit hard to describe on a podcast, but, um, you know, a, a, an extremely stiff ski isn't going to, it's not going to be very forgiving. In other words, it's not going to twist. Um, and sometimes that, that softer torsional rigidity is just more forgiving. You don't have to be as great a skier, you know, to get it on edge and, and it's not just going to throw you around. So in general, softer skis are probably better for the average person. Um, most people, if you just give them a softer ski and didn't even ask them, they're probably going to be pretty stoked. Um, it's, it's more often than not that someone's going to do that. Um, and be happy than if you put them on a stiff ski and they just have no idea how to ski on it. So, um, as you're looking, as you're looking for good characteristics, obviously, you know, you really need to figure out the application of, you know, like I said, geography, where are you skiing? <laughs> you know, what are you planning on doing with it? Um, and you know, is it your, your powder specific ski or is it a backcountry ski or is it a resort ski? Um, you know, do you have the ability to own three or four sets of skis like some people do, or do you have one ski f to do it all? So, um, so just to recap really quick, early tip rise, traditional camber, the tail can kind of be whatever, probably not super turned up like a crazy twin tip. It's not going to kill you, but you know, it's, it's just not that big a deal. Uh, most people, you're probably going to want a soft to medium soft ski. And I guess the one thing we didn't cover was the width underfoot. Me personally, in 2020, if, if I'm going to pick a ski for my all mountain ski, I've got one choice for the entire season. I'm going to choose, and I, so I live in Utah, so I'm going to be, you know, the conditions are usually pretty good here. You know, even when it's bad, it's better than a lot of places. You know, softer snow, we're going to get some powder days. But if I had to choose one ski, I would choose one that is probably about uh, 95 to 105 millimeters underfoot. And I think that's the sweet spot. Most likely, I'd go with something closer to a 105 uh, if I was an East Coast person, Midwest, I'd probably stick to like, you know, 90, 95. And 95 would kind of be the top end of of that range that I'd be looking for. But I feel like that's kind of, yeah, that 105, I, I like that. It's nimble enough to kind of get around the bumps, the trees. Um, I, I can make quick snappy turns. I can still open it up and make bigger GS style turns. I can ski powder. I can ski hard pack, you know. And I don't feel like I'm, I'm so pigeonholed into one area where I absolutely, um, I can only do one thing. So hopefully that kind of gives you guys an overview of what kind of features to look for, um, based on where you ski, what your ability level is and what type of telemark skiing you're talking about. Um, I think that hopefully that gives you a starting point and uh, you guys can always email in and ask questions. Uh, you can even call the shop and talk to us. It's a, it's an extreme, you know, I'm, 
I'm not surprised at how many people have uh, written in and asked that to be a topic of the podcast. Um, but I think that it's a it's a hard it's a hard thing to answer in just generalities in terms of saying, hey, this is this is what type of ski you should get because it really depends on the person and kind of what you're looking to do. Funny enough, the one thing I thought of, you know, kind of as I'm explaining this is, you know, I'm thinking about even some people that come in that say, hey, the application I'm looking to use for a setup is uh, I like to walk with my dog after work um, on on some cross country trails. Uh, it's rolling hills. Um, I might be able to make some tele turns kind of in between stuff. And they, you know, they're almost going to almost like a more uh, almost like what would be a kind of that late seventies, early eighties kind of Nordic vibe. And, um, I think that's really the gamut, you know, as we toss a lot of words around, you know, like what a telemark ski is, you know, what a telemark ski was, um, like I've said in previous podcasts, you know, telemark is a downhill technique, you know? Um, so it's really important that you, you know, when you're putting a certain ski setup together, you're looking at the application as a whole and, you know, sometimes one ski can't do it all. And so it's really important to kind of figure out what you're trying to accomplish in terms of, of the turn. And, um, you know, that's going to help kind of direct you to what type of ski you're going to want to get. Um, to kind of finish up this podcast, I wanted to I want to cover one thing because I, I know that this is going to come up. You know, we get through the skis. We kind of give you some features to look for, some things to identify. And I know what the next thing is on your mind is you're going to go, all right, I bought the skis. I got my boots. I got my bindings. Where do I mount my Telemark bindings on my skis? This is one of the most common topics that uh, kind of prevails in telemark culture and has for quite some time and uh and for good reason because it obviously affects what you're doing and kind of going back to this application concept what is the application of the ski that i'm going to ski on uh what's my ability level what uh what kind of ski am i on where do i live these are all things that are going to play into this, this overall question of where we're going to mount the telemark skis, um, with these bindings that we have. So the first things first in 2020, I never thought in a million years that I would hear the phrase pin line still. And to give you a little history of what pin line is, because I'll hear people come in to the shop and they'll be like, you know, we'll be taking a mountain and you know, taking details down and asking them questions. And they'll be like, should I mount it on pin line? And that's what I used to do back in the day, you know? And uh, basically what pin line represents is, uh, and, and I guess I, I'm not giving you the entire phrase, you know, 25, 30 years ago, you would mount, there was a phrase called mounting pins on cord center. And what that meant was kind of going back to some of those skis we were talking about, especially the double cambered skis and in the early nineties with some of these Tua's and some of these skis, uh, that had a, a long effective edge and, and kind of had more of a Nordic feel to them. What you would do is you would essentially cord center represents if you were to essentially take a cord and take the length of the cord tip to tail and take the center point of that, uh, in other words, if you measured tip to tail and divided by two and made a mark on the ski, that would be your cord center. From that point, what people would do is actually put the pins or going back to your boots, your 75 millimeter duck bill boots, and probably a lot of these were leather back in the day. The pin line is where the three holes are on the toe of your boot. And you're going to put that you're basically going to mark a little thing on the side of your boot that correlates to where those holes come across the front of the toe. And you're then going to match the cord center with the pin line on your boot. 
And that's how people used to mount. And that kind of goes in. Some people might be thinking, oh, well, you know, we measure ball of the foot on the balance point of the ski and all this kind of stuff. So there's a couple ways, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, eras and eras of this have been around where people are talking about where to mount these skis. But that was back in the day, that was kind of pins on cord was traditionally the way that you mounted telemark skis. There's your history <laughs> again to get perspective because this is literally still happening. Um, why this is important is in, in, in right now in 2020, most skis that you're going to pick up are going to have what we call a recommended boot center line of the ski. Okay. So in most cases, the, the ski manufacturer has determined a recommended line and he has put it on the ski so that you know where the middle of your boot should match up on the ski. And, you know, this usually happens when people are testing the skis uh, for that particular length of ski and model of ski. And, you know, they've come to the conclusion, hey, here's the recommended place that we think your boot should go on the ski. So when you take your skis to get in and get them mounted um this is a this is my hot tip for the day if you live somewhere where you can't bring skis to our telemark shop in salt lake or uh you know which most people don't have the ability to do that and you might be going to a box store or a local ski shop one thing to be very careful of this is your hot tip if you walk in and say i'd like to get my telemark skis mounted and they're like, okay, cool. You need a telemark mount. Be very careful that you go over where you want it done. Because what I have often seen over the years is people hear the word telemark and they think, oh, you need a telemark mount. And they will give you a pins on cord center mount on a modern ski. Uh, in most cases, that will put you like four to six inches behind where you're supposed to be so uh, you're not going to have a whole lot of tail and your skiing's probably going to suffer and you're probably going to hate your ski and think that you bought the worst ski on the planet but in fact you might have just gotten a 1985 style mount on a 2020 pair of skis so there's your hot tip for the day folks um, so kind of going back to this boot recommended center line, um, is this the end all be all? No. Um, there's obviously, you know, all sorts of things that you want to consider, you know, um, in terms of where you're going to do it. But this is in most cases, in most cases, this, the ski has been determined that that's the best place, you know, to put the boot. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. And I, I trust the ski manufacturer and a lot of these are Alpine ski manufacturers and I understand that. Um, but you know, take into account all these things that we talked about in terms of finding, um, you know, what makes this ski right for you, you know, take into account your type of skier, uh, you know, how large your boot is, how short the ski is. And, 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 and what I mean by that is maybe you're a, maybe you're a taller person and, uh, you know, you've got a extremely large foot, you know, like a size 29 or 30 Mondo. Uh, and, and your skis aren't that tall. Maybe you're, you're only skiing like a, a 175. You know, you may, you may want to shift from the recommended line in order to compensate for the largeness of your boot on there. And, and, and a good professional person that can mount your skis, uh, could walk you through that. Um, but I, you know, the boot recommended center line of the ski, I always start there and then kind of go from there. Uh, a lot of times you hear like minus two from boot recommended center. Well, also make sure you understand uh, the manufacturer's line and understand where it's at and kind of assess it out. You know, don't just go minus two because someone told you to go minus two. <laughs> you know, understand that there's, uh, different ways to do it. You know, one of the, one of the companies I can think of like in Salt Lake that we see a lot is um, DPS, for instance. They have a boot recommended line, um, but you wouldn't want to go 
back uh, two centimeters, you would most likely, if you didn't go on the boot recommended center, you'd actually go forward. Um, but then like a company like Volet, we deal a lot with them. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see people go back. Maybe they want, um, again, you know, you're compensating for a large boot. Maybe, and this is the other thing. If you go back from the boot recommended center, you're going to get more tip, um, you know, than tail. And you're, you know, you're talking a couple centimeters, but it can kind of give you, sometimes it, people will say it's kind of a more traditional feel, you know, a minus two mount. So like on a Volesky, if you go back two centimeters, um, it might give you just a little bit more nose if you're used to kind of an older setup. But we could talk about this for days and days and days. Um, when in doubt, go in the boot recommended center line and trust that. Um, as far as measuring the midsole of the boot, NTN's pretty easy. You just go pull a tape measure from the tip of the, you know, tip of the sole to the, to the heel. Um, as far as, uh, and I've heard some debate with 75, some guys pull it, pull the measurement from the front of the toe all the way back. We at our shop have always standardized it and pull from the middle of the pin, middle pin hole back to the heel and cut that in two and make that the boot, uh, midsole line. So, um, so yeah, that's it. Um, I think that kind of gives you guys a brief overview of Telemark specific skis or Telemark centric skis, kind of what features to look for once you get it, where to mount it. Um, with all of this, you know, I'm trying to cover as much as possible. You're always welcome. Please, you can reach out to us at the shop, give us a ring, talk through it with somebody. Uh, you can also email customer service at freehealllife.com to discuss things with our techs. And uh, don't hesitate. Um, this is the kind of stuff that's really going to, you know, help ease your mind. And again, you're spending your hard earned dollars on skis, boots, and bindings. The last thing you want to do is put an extra set of holes in that you're not happy with. Um, so, we, you know, we always encourage people to, uh, talk through it with somebody who actually knows kind of what's going on and, uh, have someone help kind of guide you in the proper procedure based on the application that you're looking for with your skis. And that way you're going to have the best, uh, experience telemark skiing, you know, whether you're a beginner or an expert or somewhere in between. So, um, Really appreciate you guys. Um, I think that kind of wraps it up for this podcast. Um, how you can support us, uh, you can shop for your Telemark gear on freehealllife.com. That's our website for the shop. Uh, if you're in Salt Lake or nearby or coming into Salt Lake, feel free uh, to drop by the shop and, and check it out. We'd love to see you. We're open uh, uh, usually from 1st of October until mid-April and by appointment kind of through the summer. So um, if you're coming to town, we'd love to see you. But if not, you can always check stuff out online. We've got new gear, used gear, uh, hard to find parts for your bindings, uh, boots, accessories, uh, tons of cool t-shirts. Uh, if you're looking for more information on you know gear, you can check out telemarksgear.com or our YouTube channel for Telemark Skier. Uh, magazine also has all of the free heel life shop tech videos uh, kind of overviews of equipment and all the latest that we can come up with so we're always trying to pump out new content there and uh, just really keep it moving so much love you guys uh, really appreciate all of you that are listening out there and appreciate uh, your questions and all the emails I'm working at kind of keeping up on getting the emails, uh, getting back to you guys all that have written in. And I, I really appreciate you guys doing that. Um, if you want to write in, let me know how I'm doing. Um, you can reach me at podcast at freehealllife.com and please take a second and rate and review us. That helps us, uh, be seen by other people that might be interested in telemark skiing and might want to get into it or might have questions about all the the gear and how it all works so until next time you guys spread telemark always and we'll see you next week <laughs>